Mapping the timeline of genres and their popularity is a really funny thing. Some eras in gaming are solely defined by the fact they have a certain type of game that was really popular. Xbox 360 and PS3 were defined by shooter games, N64 was defined by 3D platformers, and the Gizmondo was defined specifically by sticky balls, and that's it. At the same time, it's also interesting to see where these genres fall out of style. Good luck finding a halfway decent 3D platform on the original Xbox, dirtbag! When it comes to genres that shone the brightest and then died the hardest, beat-em-ups have to take that crown. You could throw a rock at a crowded arcade and probably hit a beat-em-up. And you'd also cause several hundred dollars worth of damages, but who's counting? The genre was everywhere in the late 80s to early 90s. Capcom was leading the charge with games like Final Fight and Captain Commando. Konami was perfecting the genre with games like X-Men and The Simpsons. And Sega was propping up the Genesis with games like Streets of Rage and Golden Axe. Beat-em-ups were the king of arcades and home consoles, until the PS1 released and every single developer making them turned to dust. Yeah, the fifth generation is the hard cutoff point for beat-em-ups and their popularity. With games moving to 3D and pixel art considered old news, seriously, they said games like Metal Slug and Mega Man X4 were outdated. Metal Slug! And beat-em-ups were one of those genres that just doesn't play well with 3D. Some tried, most failed, and it seemed like beat-em-ups would be banished to the same dustbin as other quarter-munching high-score arcade games. Now, while consoles had all but abandoned beat-em-ups, the GBA specifically was one of the last safe havens for the genre. Games like Gekido Advance, Astro Boy and Dragon Ball Advanced Adventure were all fun, but sadly not enough to invigorate larger scale interest in the genre. Other games had taken cues from beat-em-ups like Yakuza or the Batman Arkham games, not to mention the hack and slash genre is basically the beat-em-ups edgy younger brother, uh, but to call them proper beat-em-ups would be a stretch. You can smell a beat-em-up a mile away, and I don't think anybody's gonna mistake this for the next Bad Dudes vs. Dragon Ninjas. However, the end of the 2000s came and something wonderful started to happen. People were getting closer to death! Nostalgia was finally Finally in vogue with larger developers, and what genre evokes more nostalgia than beat-em-ups? Platformers, RPGs, puzzle games, racing games, shooter games. Okay, okay, so sixth place isn't bad. That's like a tinfoil metal. See, before this, the last real pulse we had felt from beat-em-ups was in 1996 with Dungeons & Dragons Shadows over Mistara. Between then and now, you could count the number of beat-em-ups worth playing on one hand with about three fingers to spare. However, come 2008, we got Castle Crashers. 2010 brought Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. Double Dragon Neon in 2012, there was a very obvious reason for the comeback of beat-em-ups. See, with platforms like the Xbox Live Arcade and PlayStation Store making bite-sized console games more acceptable, beat-em-ups with their simple gameplay style, short length, and multiplayer focus were pretty much the perfect games for downloadable titles. From there, we had games like Dragon's Crown, which despite being on the PlayStation Vita, does count. Streets of Fury, but only the parts with the nostalgia critic in it. Fight and Rage, River City Girls, The Takeover, Streets of Rage 4, and with companies like Capcom releasing bundles of their old games in the beat-em-up collection, beat-em-ups are well and truly back in full force like they were in the 90s. And who best to solidify that return than the same reptiles responsible for what many say is the best beat-em-up of all time? That's right, you thought this was the only history lesson you were getting today? You haven't even gotten to the transition yet! Have you ever thought about how weird the Ninja Turtles are? Yes, obviously you have. You have ears that function, so you realize that stringing those four words together is just a word soup of things that a child may look at and think, Yes, yes, very good. You piqued my interest. I think we've all just gotten so used to the phrase Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that hearing it out loud doesn't even register anymore. Ah, oh, they're four mutant turtle brothers in the sewers of New York raised by a mutated rat who taught them kung fu and fight off a living cheese grater who, depending on the year, is just an edgy Kirby enemy. Okay, proceed. Created by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird in May of 1984 for Mirage Comics, which was just their apartment, but it had a logo, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles started life as a simple joke sketch of just that, a Ninja Turtle. Eventually, the sketch got passed back and forth between one another to the point they had all four turtles with their own unique weapons. Revisiting the idea a year later, they decided to make the story an homage to the Frank Miller run of Daredevil comics. Their way of doing this was by saying, Yeah, you know Daredevil's origins? Well, didn't you see the four turtles that were there too, idiot? After Lion King one and a halfing their way into an origin story, down to swapping out the Daredevil Ninja team The Hand for a team called The Foot, Eastman and Laird now had 3,000 comics and a massive problem. Ah, oh, crap, how are we gonna get people to buy this? Seeing as giving them out at Halloween was off the table for a few months, they decided to take out ads in comic buyer's guides to try to drum up support. They ended up playing a full symphony of success as they sold through the original 3,000 copies and a further 6,000. 15,000 
thousand copies sold of issue two led the pair to take on the turtles full time with each issue a bigger success than the last now that sounds amazing but what's important to remember is that this was indie comic success in the 80s this was well before independent publishing was something regularly done word of mouth is what really saved the turtles in this time before the internet all they really had were those ads so they needed the good faith of the people who read the comics to advertise for them while retaining full creative control these two managed to put up numbers that turned the heads of a lot of powerful people including mark freeman he was an agent from the dark lands proposing a deal for a massive expansion now most people who had tried this before were normally met with an oak door shooting their nose bones into their prefrontal cortex but on a whim they'd chosen to hear out mark within 30 days mark had gotten them a deal with playmate toys which while they were excited to work with eastman and laird didn't exactly love the current version of the turtles why was that weren't they the pizza loving goof nuggets that we all know and love well pretty much except for the part where they killed the shredder in the first issue had drugs and alcohol and didn't even have their own colored bandanas they were all red so a few changes were in order 1988 was the beginning of the second era of teenage mutant ninja turtles as the first cartoon was being shopped around to various stations with a five-part miniseries they were a lot softer than the original comics mostly using the origin and concepts from the comics to tell stories more conducive to a saturday morning cartoon rather than grindhouse body horror it did bring in its own additions like several millions of dollars for the people involved turtle mania a more ethically sourced version of hulkamania ran wild on america overnight a gritty little independent comic was the talk of the town it cannot be over stated how much of a success the turtles were people of a certain age know that for a time if you weren't a ninja turtle you were lame that success was spun off into a film made for only 13 million dollars that's a snot rocket's worth of money in hollywood and without a major distributor was actually an independent film and until the blair witch project was the highest grossing independent film ever made the cartoon series would continue on until 1996 the turtles would have two more movies of descending quality with it continuing to balloon into live performances of their album and then a documentary about said tour based on their album done entirely in kayfabe they had this smelly prick show off leonardo's one string bass guitar like any kids were gonna say how the fuck is he playing that and a christmas special where the turtles fought to overcome full body necrosis by the look of their suits i mean they managed to get a pair of wrestlers made in their image named the toxic turtles and for those of you wondering yes indeed it did die a death in front of that crowd If you're thinking, hmm, this is quite a lot of adolescent monstrosity shinobi reptiles, you've managed to reverse engineer America by the late 90s. There was only so much turtle that could be taken in at one time, and the 90s had reached a critical mass. People were, for lack of a better term, completely sick of our half-shelled heroes. That coffin was nailed shut by Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles The Next Mutation, a continuation of the cartoon done in live action by Hayam Saban, the same guy behind Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. To try to liven up the brand, they added a fifth turtle named Venus and hmm, this was a big crash and burn completely separate from the fact they put boobs on a turtle but it did get a crossover with Power Rangers so it was almost worth it I said almost from there Kevin Eastman sold his share in the turtles to Peter Laird as they had been working on something that was originally a joke for the better part of 10 years and he just wanted to do something else creatively come 2003 and the turtles were back with a new show produced by four kids entertainment TMNT 2003 was a lot darker than the previous series airing alongside heavily censored anime like Yu-Gi-Oh and One Piece while those shows couldn't get away with showing a buzzsaw this one got several on-screen deaths the decapitation of the shredder and the Saturday morning body horror that is Baxter Stockman's entire existence now I don't want to get speculative but I think there might have been a little bias the series would go on for six years and six seasons with incredibly weird breaks where they'd go to the future and then back to the past with 2007 being an incredibly odd time where we got another Turtles movie that would air alongside the show but not be based on it and it was its own thing called TMNT if you can get past the fact it's a movie about stone statue hunting demons that coincidentally has a Ninja Turtles subplot it's pretty all right I guess now, after the 2003 show wrapped Mirage and Laird fully sold the rights to the Turtles to Viacom, owners of Nicola... Nick June is back, baby! Nick! August! It would be three years until the Ninja Turtles finally got a crack at another show with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2012 variety. Now, there's a lot of talk about which Ninja Turtle show is the best one. There's the classic one, 2003, or 2012. But, at least we can all agree, it's definitely 2012. 2014 marked the return to live action for the Turtles under the watchful eye of Michael Bay, who mistook the Turtles for super mutants and made them look just 
Oh, just so tall, and they had pug noses. I wish they'd stop looking at me. This was followed up with Out of the Shadows in 2016, which at least got Seamus to play Rocksteady, so that's great. Ah, crap, I mentioned wrestling three times. You know what that means. <laughs> In 2017, this brand of turtles wrapped up and we got a new show announced in 2018, Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Thank you for naming it something other than Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles so I don't have to awkwardly shove a number into a perfectly fine name. I haven't personally seen enough of this show to draw my own conclusions on it, but I will say two things. One is that Flying Bark TV Animation is making the best TV animation right now. Have you seen this show in Monkey Kid in Motion? Dear Lord, this should be illegal. The second is that this show had its back broken by Nickelodeon cutting its second season in half which is just something the Nickelodeon likes to do after a stressful day. The biggest turtle development since was the reuniting of Eastman and Laird after years of not speaking to work together on the critically acclaimed Turtles comic, The Last Ronin. Now this is a lot of info to take in, but I'm not an animation channel no matter what the 35 minutes of me talking about animation in June would say. We talk about video gems here, and Turtles got lots of them. The first Turtles game was the creatively titled Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in 1989 for the NES. This was a weird transition period where they were mixing and matching cartoon and comic iconography. Cover art was comics turtles with the all red headbands, but they're color coded in the game. Shredder is model after the comics, but April is cartoon. Oh yeah, and the game sucks too, but I really want to focus on that Splinter sprite art. This is infamous for being one of, if not the worst turtle game for a lot of reasons. They gave all the turtles their weapons from the show, which which is great news for Donatello and Leo, while Mikey and Raph are left in a ditch because their weapons are terrible. The game is filled with impossible jumps, sometimes literally in the case of the DOS version of the game, and then there's the damn level. It's one of the most frustrating levels in the entire NES generation, and had people branding this game as a total dud. Which, in fairness, is fair, so people didn't exactly have high hopes going into the follow-up release the same year. Teenage Mutant Ninja fuck you! This was the Turtles' official entry point into the beat-em-up genre, with all the trademarks, simple but punchy controls, all four turtles as selectable characters, beautiful backgrounds, and tough boss fights. This would later be adapted to a pretty faithful one-for-one -one recreation on the NES, and from there things got exponentially more confusing as the next game released was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4! Excuse me? Yeah, in terms of release dates, it goes Ninja Turtles 1, Ninja Turtles 1, 4, 2, 3. It gets even worse when trying to figure out which game actually fills which number slot. Which Ninja Turtles 1 is Ninja Turtles 1? Is the original NES game 1 and the arcade game 2? Or is it that the arcade game is number 1 and the port is number 2? Is the game called Ninja Turtles 2 actually number 2? Or is it ignored because it was just on the Game Boy? Confusion over how many of these things there were aside, TMNT Turtles in Time is widely considered the best beat-em-up ever made, with the best of everything. Best graphics, best sound, best gameplay, and most importantly, best port. Unlike the ports to the NES, you weren't stuck with a downgraded reimagining of the arcade game. The SNES version was all but perfect. The all but is of course from the lack of pizza power, which was the theme of the game from the Ninja Turtles album. I cannot stress enough, they actually went out on stage looking like this. Turtles in Time, which had to be abbreviated to 4 because well, just look at it, would become the most iconic turtle game. Ask anybody to envision a turtles game and they would no doubt bring up turtles in time. That's half because of how iconic and recognizable it was, and half because the games that came out after didn't really stand a chance of beating it. Tournament Fighter was the next major game released, and its big claim to fame was the fact that nobody could figure out who this character was meant to be for years and years. After that, no major turtle games were released until the fourth and fifth games to be named Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in 2003 to coincide with a new show. These were four-player 3D beat-em-ups, and for reference, were the games that I started out my own illustrious turtle careers with. I think I actually played these before I even knew what the Ninja Turtles were. I really just jumped head first into this concept. Didn't see nothing wrong with this! It got its own two sequels in Battle Nexus and Mutant Nightmare, with each version getting lower and lower scores, with number two being completely shredded. After that, they'd stay in a sort of weird place of, well, we're making Turtles games, but I don't know if anyone's actually gonna buy them. Mutant Melee and Smash Up were their attempt to get into the party fighter market, TMNT was a tie-in to the movie, and then the 2012 era started. Out of the Shadows was a disgusting-looking Arkham clone that was one of the games featured at the XBLA Summer of Arcade event. This predated the Bay Turtles, they're ugly and horrible in their own way. Whereas the other Turtles games managed to sneak by undetected from the general gaming press surrounding bad games, Out of the Shadows ironically shone a great big light on how bad it was. 
There was the 2012 series government mandated tie-in game which had all the depth of the arcade games without any of the charm. There's the 2014 movie game on 3DS which I'm only mentioning to burden you with the knowledge of its existence. It's an action RPG, ain't that something? TMNT Mutants in Manhattan is a game that marked a lot of first for the Turtles. It was the first time that a game was fully based on the comics, being based on the IDW design for the characters. It was also the first time that the Turtles had teamed up with the kings of character action, Platinum Games. And this game was dripping with the style that they bring to almost every project they work on. <laughs> You. It's honestly one of my favorite games of theirs visually. They really managed to translate a comic book into 3D better than most. It was also the first Turtles games to rank number four on Pro Jared's top 10 worst games of 2016 list, so that's gotta be a good sign. From there, the Ninja Turtles were relegated to crossover games like Injustice 2 and the Nicktoons Kart Racer games. Until finally, in 2021, they announced a brand new standalone game, first with an animated trailer, sadly confirming it wasn't a next mutation game. I know a lot of people are tired of nostalgia pander with franchises like this and the Power Rangers treating the original series like the only one worth going back to, but with the Turtles it's a little less egregious, since it has only four main series as opposed to the Power Rangers 200 or so, and those series either being shot in the back of the head, shot in the back of the head but longer ago, or tied up in legal troubles as it was co-produced by four kids. Not only was the actual game looking gorgeous with the team behind Scott Pilgrim vs. The World tackling it, but the gameplay looked much deeper than before. No quarter circle forwards or anything, but it had a lot more more flash to the whole thing. Add on top of that features like six-player multiplayer and non-turtle characters like April and Splinter, and this was said to be a can't-miss title, so much that I didn't! Despite how much I know that this is an odd game for me to be talking about. First off, this game is only a month or so old. This isn't an obscure GameCube game or Disney tying game, so why I'm talking about it is anybody's guess. Even more so when you consider... I'm not even a big Turtles fan. I mean, I watched the 2003 show, loved the 2012 show, but other than that... I mean, I think the Shredder looks cool, and I own this Kermit Funko Pop that's kind of like a Ninja Turtle. I'm coming into this game as a bigger beat-em-up fan than I am a Turtles fan, so I think I got a pretty unique perspective on things. Let's see where this game ends up on the chart I rate all games on. Quality of Ninja Turtle live-action costume. See, Ultra Kill is a TMNT 1 costume, Balan's like a TMNT 3 or Out of Our Shells costume, and Ultimate Tenkaichi is a Christmas special. So the game starts with the same animated opening from the trailer before giving you the option of either arcade or story. The difference is enough that I ended up playing through both, as well as an additional playthrough of the story mode to test out characters. Speaking of characters, you get the choice of all six of them, with Casey Jones being locked behind a playthrough of story mode despite being shown off in trailers. This game innovates on the beat-em-up formula of their characters being tough guy, fast guy, and guy for the person who only picks Mario when playing Mario Kart. Each character has their own stat line that varies them up from one another without enough technical complexity to make them play really different from one another. If you learn a good combo rhythm with one, you learned it for most characters. When I was younger, I had a massive little brother syndrome, so whenever me and my brother would play games like this, or Teen Titans, or Nicktoons Unite, I'd always stick with one character and refuse to play as any other one. Beast Boy, SpongeBob, I was a real stinker, and for the Ninja Turtles game, if I wasn't playing as Leonardo, you could bet I was whining to my mom about it, so we're going in blue for this one. So the game's plot is summarized in a whole subtitle. The Shredder is back, and he wants revenge. What for? I don't know. Pick a decapitation and just say it was that. We rush over to the first level and get thrown headfirst into combat. There was a short screen earlier telling us how to play, but I do my best work on the job. Your main controls are movement, a jump button, basic attack, dodge, and a super attack. You can double tap to dash, can mix jumps and attacks for air combos, dive kicks and launchers, and can attack out of dodges to keep the pressure up. Then there's the special attack, which can be performed either on the ground, in the air, or while dodging for different attacks. Each one has different properties like Donnie and Casey pulling people in, Rap and April being able to mix it with their dashes to add momentum and ping pong around the stage, and the other three are there too. Air attacks usually let out a big area of effect slam to take out a lot of enemies, and the dodge super is great for flying through them. You can build up your super bar by either doing combos or by taunting. For combos, you have to reach a certain threshold of hits to earn more meter. And if you're hit at any point during it, you not only lose the combo, but the whole whole bar as well. With the taunt, you get the whole bar automatically, but get locked in place, which leads to good footage to show how at the slightest amount of breathing room, I become an insufferable jerk who taunts at the worst possible moments. It's a fantastic combat system, the perfect party game where anybody can just pick up and play and have fun, either button mashing or trying to string moves together to up their combo. Back to the first level and we see the game's next big positive. It's absolutely gorgeous. The decision to go with sprite-based models rather than 3D ones not only adds to the charm, I mean, look at Donatello 
as taunt animation, it's magnificent. But the work that was put into the backgrounds gets put on full display. The level itself in the TV station is super fun in how you get to go from the front desks to the offices through the sets of different TV shows before finally making it to the control center. The levels themselves do a great job of telling a story independent of the actual plot. Part of the detail I was raving about is also in the enemies. You'll find footbots in all sorts of different situations, like typing at computers, talking on phones, even working on the shows themselves. It's a good thing they're so charming since they make up the lion's share of the enemies in the game. You'll fight some other guys like Mousers, Stone Soldiers, this thing, but for the most part you're gonna be fighting this Crayola collection of ninjas. The standard grunts without a weapon are a little more than combo fodder, but the ones with tonfas that fall from the ceiling can seriously piss off. So many combo strings were ended by these guys just coming out of nowhere. There are also these shield guys that require you to either get behind them or do a heavy swing to kill them. It's less thinking critically on how to take out an enemy and more frustrating. I am playing an arcade beat-em-up specifically to avoid thinking. They are lucky they are so much fun to hit or we might have issues. When you eventually make it to the end you square off with Bebop in the first boss battle. Luckily, something not preserved from the classic beat-em-up era is the boss fights being unfair horse shit. Bebop has a few simple attacks, shooting his gun, sending a henchman, and his charge attack. I will say that with the jump being just a little sluggish, these attacks can be annoying since your lateral movement options kinda don't exist. The dodge has horizontal movement down pat, but moving up and down fast, eh, it's just not happening. He's no trouble though as we take him down. Before we can take back Krang's head though, Rocksteady hops in and steals it anyway. Before we get to the next level, we do have to see what makes story mode and arcade mode so different. We're not only getting a cute overworld, but we also get to visit April's boss and get tasked to collect his old headlines for points. What do the points get you? Shouldn't you be grateful you're just getting points in the first place? Not just that, but we also have challenges to complete for each stage. They can vary from throw enemies at the screen, don't get grabbed in the stage, don't fall down holes, don't get hit for the end entire stage. Of all the challenges, this is the one I never went back to try. With how many enemies can fly at you from out of nowhere, sometimes you need to know where enemies come from specifically on each screen to avoid damage. I think the challenges are a fun addition that encourage you to use your whole toolkit, but the never get hit challenges just elongate the game in the worst way possible. But you know, you can just not do it. The challenges don't give you anything except a way to test your skill. They're the definition of optional. I'm not even sure if you get points out of them, so they're worthless. On to level two, and we're right where the last level left off, outside the TV studio with the wheels of our ride being stolen. This level introduces more power-ups to play with, like the Maximum Pizza that lets you go nuts on a group of enemies with a super move, and the Infinite Power Pizza that lets you use your super moves infinitely for a short time. You can also see another difference in this mode to arcade mode as we level up. When you reach a certain threshold of enemies defeated, you level up and get an upgrade to a base stat, either more health, more lives, get another bar to do super moves, or access to the aerial and dodge supers. This is a fun way to give you more boosts the more you go on without complicating the experience too much. It's not something like Scott Pilgrim with active RPG elements, they're more like random bonuses you get for doing a good job. As you go through the level, you can find new ninja variants like the yellow ones that toss boomerangs and the pink ones that wind up for a big hit. The boomerangs can be annoying to deal with since you actually have to slide under them, and the pink ones are just good practice for throwing, which... I don't really like since there isn't a dedicated grab button, instead you just run into the guys and then toss them. You're never invincible during this whole process, but you sure are vulnerable. Don't throw, it's suboptimal. As you go through the level, you find not only Irma, who has her own set of collectibles, but also see ninjas stealing more and more car parts, which leads us right to Rocksteady, who's taking them all to build the Turtle Tenderizer. Rocksteady isn't much different from Bebop, just a little trickier thanks to having a spread shot blast and grenades along with his charge attack. Another quit bopping and he and Bebop retreat into the finished car, which takes us into Mutants Over Broadway. This is a skateboard level just like out of Turtles in Time. Visually, it's incredible as you get to see all the detail in the background as they fly past. Gameplay-wise, the backgrounds are really pretty. Yeah, this level isn't the best when it comes to playing it. The skateboard is a little harder to control than your regular turtle, and the majority of the enemies in this level are these little fly guys who can only be hit with flying attacks, which makes them just that little bit harder to land hits on than you think they'd be. Spectacle-wise, I think it makes up for it fine enough, but this level has the challenges to not be hit and not to be hit by any obstacles. Easier said than done when they're flying in from out of nowhere. The boss is against the turtle tenderizer, and sadly, the jank of the stage translates to the boss fight. Getting close enough to the car without taking damage is hard, especially when the actual hurtbox of the car is almost impossible to pin down. 
I can't tell if the body of the car even hurts you or if it's just the wheels that do. I almost end up losing all my lives, but thankfully it's over and we move on. A quick note while we're all here, all four of the original Turtle voices are back for this game, which is a treat. Cam Clark needs to be protected at all costs. Florida man offers $10,000, $10,000 for safe return of his stolen monkey. <laughs> Well, I will offer you a lot. However, April, Splinter, Casey, and Shredder all have new voice actors who only show up in the additional voiceover section, which, cold-blooded, but okay, everyone still sounds fantastic, except Shredder. Destroy the Turtles. I don't know, man. That's not what I hear when I think Shredder. He sounds way too young to me. I'm probably just spoiled on James Avery, Scotty Ray, and Kevin Michael Richardson, in all honesty. I brought back some takeout, so, like, let's get down and pig out. All right, voiceover professional who applied their craft in a job I can only ever dream of. Let me show you how it's done. All right, this is my Shredder audition. <laughs> Ah, pesky turtles. All right, please cast me. I'm kind of between jobs right now. On to level four, and after their car crashes, someone abducts Bebop while Rocksteady runs away with Krang's head. Here we're introduced to the Whip Ninjas, who can hold you in place and let the other ones wail on you. We also have to deal with the Archer Ninjas, who fire a single arrow and decide their job is done as they just leave. We also get to see me, but as a foot soldier. This level takes place in a zoo, which has a great atmosphere with the animals stampeding through, monkeys throwing bananas from behind their bars, and a bunch of cute background animals. Not only do we find more journals for Irma and headlines for April's boss, but you also find a disgusting bug for uh, who the heck is that? Showing my turtle naivete here for not immediately recognizing one of the punk frogs. Same goes for the boss, Ground Chuck and Dirt Bag. These are like Kickstarter backer characters, right? Like that Undertale Vore guy. They're a tag team boss where you gotta take on both members at once. Dirtbag spends most of the fight buried underground, making holes for you to fall in and flashing his helmet light to blind you, while Ground Chuck stays above ground, being an actual threat. He has Rocksteady and Bebop's charge attack while mixing it with horn missiles. Since he doesn't get dazed when he hits the wall, it's a lot harder to find a good time to get a shot in, but it does make it a thrilling fight. Bebop and Rocksteady gave you plenty of room to breathe. These guys don't give you an inch. After disposing of them, we follow Krang's head underground for King of the Spill, where a bunch of rats steal it. This level takes place in the subway, so we have to spend a good amount of time worrying about the red line train actually running on time for once and turning us into roadkill. These pink ninjas love to enter the screen by throwing shurikens and will retreat every now and again to do the same. They are one of the worst for ruining combos and should be a priority. That's New York style pizza, I bet it's still good after being run over by a train. Huh, it's actually better. We also get the Mousers as enemies for the first time, which are really just more combo fodder that can latch onto you and leave you vulnerable. There are also massive Mousers that can vomit up more if you leave them alone. We find yet another Punk Frog, and I'm so excited that I'm forcing Future Jack to put in the first piece of art that comes up when you Google Punk Frog fan art. This is legally binding and cannot be deleted from the script. <laughs> The boss for this level is the Rat King, who is the first just a guy in the whole game so far. The fact that he's not also a rat is astounding. His fight is the simplest so far as he has two attacks, either football tackling and throwing you, or summoning a wave of rats, and not a belt buckle in sight. What is a boy to do? The rats are like death by a thousand cuts. They'll latch onto you for a second like the mousers and take off a single tick of health before flying away. You don't really care about it at first until the Rat King comes in with a throw to deal the real damage. The only real problem with the fight is how when you have the Rat King King cornered, he'll jump away and be free from damage for a few seconds, which can get old when he's close to death and just barely escaping. He still gets his butt kicked all the same as Rocksteady shows back up to steal the head. I love April's sprite here. She's just pointing like, you'll see in the sh The next level is in the mall with us starting outside and having to work our way in from the food court all the way to the arcade. Here we see Foot Clan members just trying to function in normal society with those dastardly toitles ruining it. We get introduced to the super spider bots, which I can only imagine made a super rad toy. They can be a real pain to take down if you forget you have a dodge button, which, shock of shocks, I did for a little. I have to get a little funky with how I handle this stage since one of the challenges is to clear it without using any super moves. I have to rely more on throws and environmental attacks. These dark blue ninjas have maces that make them almost impossible to approach and give them a really strong attack, but leaves them vulnerable once they use it. They're like the shield enemies, but more fun to fight since you have more options to deal with them, like sliding under their mace when they swing it. Not only do we find April's co-worker Vernon in this stage, but the third of hopefully 20 more punk frogs. Keep them coming, Maybe I love it. This level ratchets up the difficulty a fair bit by throwing a lot more enemy waves at you between health pickups, including two of these big spiders. But it's clear when we get to the boss why that is. The boss of this stage is the gamer girl that all other gamer girls look up to, 
new Tempestra. I say it becomes clear when we get to the boss because save for one later on, Tempestra is the easiest boss in the game. She has three attacks, summoning one each of either Bootleg, Bebop, or Rocksteady, summoning them both at once, or making a little electrical field. These two only have one attack each, which is either a super easy to dodge belch or spinning around on the ground, and when they're out at the same time, they can actually interrupt each other. Great teamwork, guys. She's an absolute cakewalk of a boss. Then this random foot soldier comes in like he didn't realize the level was over and gets out. Turns out we were duped since the arcade machine actually had Krang's body in it and Bebop and Rocksteady make off with it. Roof Run and Reptiles is next and since it takes place on the New York skyline it's full of bottomless pits, which of course the level tasks you with never falling in. Thank you very much, Stage. You get introduced to the Lime Ninjas who have spears that will charge directly into you. Eventually we end up on an elevator with enemies endlessly spawning until we get to the top. There's an infinite energy pizza right in the corner, but I know better and save it till there aren't enough enemies to make good use of it and with the one shot I do get off. I play games for a living, folks. That's what you signed up for. After that, you run into these white ninjas who are the only ones that know what they're doing and counter your hits. They're extra tricky since there's no real way of telling when they're just gonna counter hit whatever you try. The best time to attack is when they're about to go for a jump slash since they can't defend themselves. Once you get to the end of the level, it's time to fight against Bebop and Rocksteady at the same time. It's exactly that, taking on both Bebop and Rocksteady in tandem, except for Bebop's new attack where he breaks his gun and fires it all over the place. The best part is that you can lure them into doing the dash attack at the same time, and if they run into each other, they'll get dizzy. It's a wonderful touch, and it's honestly a really fun boss fight for how it tests you. This is level 1 and 2's boss at the same time, and you're handling it. Now that they're out of commission, Wingnut, who I'm only 50% sure was in the original cartoon, takes off with the torso, and we have to chase him through the skies. Panic in the Sky is another skateboard style of level, but with a lot more of these ninjas and minigun jetpacks. It's another stage that asks you to do it hitless, which, no thank you, I have a life I'd like to get back to eventually. Stop laughing. Just like the other board level, it's stuffed to burst with traps, but luckily you can lure foot soldiers into the way to take the hit for you. There's an extended section of dodging missiles, which is super tense without being annoying like some of the other challenges. And also, this may just be me being a moron, but my depth perception is busted because I keep thinking I'm in line with the pizzas when in reality I'm continuously missing them, which is really great when I'm low on health. It's really annoying, but there's actually something in the stage to help you calm down. The game soundtrack is amazing. T. Lopes, the man responsible for the best part of Sonic Mania, is back to make the soundtrack for this game, and it's on another level. Every stage has an instantly recognizable beat to it, with some mixing in the original Turtles theme, with others being all original and super catchy. Some songs so far that I've loved are the Mall level, Roof Run and Reptiles, and the two board levels, since they're vocal. Mutants Over Broadway is fantastic, but Panic in the Sky is just... Like a shooting star, through the sky. of Wingnut! Speak of the devil and he shall appear. Wingnut more than makes up for the easier bosses before him. He has a missile salvo to keep you from getting up close, a shield attack to keep you away, and the worst of his attacks is the one where he flies all around the screen. It's super hard to predict where he's gonna show up, but jumping around like a maniac is probably the safest way to avoid him. Crisis on Coney Island comes next, and right off the bat, it introduces more new enemies, like the Plunger Guys, who have crappy melee range but can snipe you from across the screen if you don't focus on them. Same with the Glaive Ninjas. Their attacks hit hard and launch you, but they get stuck in the ground after missing. It's while haphazardly attacking anything that moves that I- OH F YES! MY FAVORITE! Uh-oh, why am I here? Funny to be the best part of the game. Later on, these black ninjas show up who are like the light pink ninjas, but a lot tougher. This stage is also one of the best visually. Having the whole thing take place in an amusement park shockingly opens it up to a lot of visual variety and fun progression, like starting out on the beach, going through the boardwalk, and eventually getting to the games. It was also here that I realized that the foot soldiers can slip on the water that the hydrants leave. This game is too charming for its own good. After that, you get a mini game of blowing up punk frog balloons. Okay, I'm starting to think the devs had a sick obsession with the punk frogs. I've gone from knowing nothing about them to knowing more than I ever wanted to. After that, and getting launched by one of the floorboards for the umpteenth time in the level, we square off with the boss, Leatherhead. He has a Cajun accent, which I'm fairly certain is the only accent made to be completely inimitable. I've tried, and the results are embarrassing. Leatherhead is barely the focus of his own boss, as every couple of seconds, the punk frogs ride past on a roller coaster to throw out items. Some of them are helpful, like pizzas, while others are explicitly to try to kill me to take over my multimedia friends. Franchise. Nice try, jerks! Leatherhead is super simple. He'll try to pop out of one of these grates and chomp you before he misses and you get to wail on him a bit. Just as I'm about to finish him off, the frogs come back in and kill still me with a barrel, you slimy scumbuckets! Also, one of their lines when they ride past is... Oh 
A few screws loose is next and starts off with a lot of vehicular toidal side as I'm hit by a bike and a car within the first few seconds. This stage has a much bigger focus on the robot enemies like Mausers than the other stages, including these Mega Mausers that spit out multiple Mini Mausers when destroyed. The level takes you from the alleyways into the packaging center of a big warehouse before finally getting to an old electronics store taken over by the foot. If I had to be mean, I'd probably say this is one of the least memorable levels in the game. It's on the short side and its theme just isn't as strong as other levels. It does have nice set pieces like some missile salvos you have to defend against, but I just wish there was a little more. Thankfully, that's made up for with the boss fight against Metalhead. He's got some far-reaching attacks, moves to make up a lot of distance and discourage wailing on him, and a fun section where he throws up a shield and forces you to hit a missile back at him to disable it. Turns out he was guarding Krang's legs and we get back on the hunt all the way to Dinosaur Stampede. Here we square off with a whole new breed of enemies, the Triceratons. If you ask me which characters first appeared in the comics and not the cartoons, Triceratons would firmly be off that list, but no, these guys came from the Murder Turtle comics. Triceratons are tanky, hit hard, and can dash in from off screen like Bebop and Rocksteady. After fighting fodder for the whole game in the Foot Clan, Triceratons are a great way to keep you paying attention, especially when you realize they come in variants with shields that need to be broken and can even poke you out of the air with their horns. Putting enemies like this in makes sure that the game doesn't become too brain dead and you actually have to think a bit more critically about how you're prioritizing enemies. Now, I know earlier I said that I'm doing this to avoid thinking critically, but it changes up a little bit when you get further into the game. Not to mention that the stage taking place in a museum means there's no end to the variety of environments. You go through a dinosaur exhibit, to a storage area, to a medieval room, to an interdimensional portal. You know, after battling through the rest of the stage, you square off with Captain Zorak, who takes the best aspects of all the other Triceraton enemies, like the blaster and shield, while mixing them with a constant stampede of dinosaurs. Hey, wait a minute! Strangely, despite being a Triceratops, he might have the least amount of health out of all the enemies in the game, since it only takes a few hits to put him on death's door. After we batter him, we're on to the next stage. It won't fly. This level is under the museum and is in the Foot's secret lab. This level... So it's not exactly hard, but it's frustrating, since it feels like every screen comes with a new hazard. Not this one, it's just filled with these dorks. I'm talking about these little sparks in the ground. They look like background elements, but if you touch them, you get a shock. You can turn them off by destroying this box in the background, but that's exactly what I thought it was, just a background element. After that is a room where the ground is constantly vomiting up these fly guys, then a room where 80% of the floor is untouchable since it's taken up by these rotor blades, and the only positive is that the enemies are more likely to step on them than you are. There's a room with freezer machines that stops you dead in your tracks, electric wall traps. This stage goes crazy with traps, and it makes it more annoying to revisit than anything. It has positives, I love the music, and the background of the foot soldiers getting paint jobs is great, but my general apathy for the stage sadly extends to the boss. Baxter Stockman spends most of the fight either in the air, making swatting him significantly harder, or in the background with a shield, firing lasers in places I'm not even. It's my least favorite stage, but at the very least, it doesn't take more than a few minutes. We figure out that we're too late as Baxter has reassembled Krang's body and runs off to Dimension X. Technodrome Redux is up next, and right off the bat, this level has my favorite stage theme. I love the synth beat and having a weird raspy voice just repeating it is all I need. We're introduced to two new enemies off the bat. The first is the orange foot soldier who can throw bombs that cut off a part of the screen until they blow up. And then there's the stone soldiers. They're like the Triceratons with their charge attack where they're invincible until it finishes and they come in two variants, basic and packing heat. Luckily, they crumble real easily in radical mode. Give up all three bars of super to get super strong attacks for a limited time. The actual level is really fun. The Technodrome is clearly falling apart, but it's still full of laser weapons, traps, and generally looks really nice. Once we get on an elevator, we have to fight the first mid-boss in the game, General Trag. He's a super-sized stone soldier with a rocket launcher who tears apart the Technodrome for shielding. He can be a real challenge since he has great attacks both up close and from afar, but if you keep hitting him, eventually he'll die. The second leg of the stage plays more into the dilapidated feel with broken screens, giant chasms, and this one ninja who decides that life isn't worth living anymore. Once we get to the end of the stage, we have to fight Chrome Dome, who at first seems invincible as none of our attacks even phase him. It's only after he jumps into the screen and goes full Battle Toad, so we find out how to hurt him. This is his favorite explosive barrel in the whole wide world, and if we blow it up, he becomes inconsolable and vulnerable to damage. I don't know why destroying the barrel is the trigger for him to be hittable, but it took me a few lives to realize it and left me fighting way more ninjas than I needed to. It's a cool and unique fight, but maybe a control console or something else comes up, something you immediately recognize as important. Since he's not in the Technodrome, we head off to hunt Shredder down in the jungles, but we did find all of Vernon's tapes, and there's a hundred points in it for us if we return them! Points! 
The Lost Arch Enemies is next and starts off with another hoverboard level over a chasm dodging meteorites. I think the game gets a little excited and throws a few too many, but who am I to judge? It's a little harder to really judge how the level progresses along with the other stages. I've never really been to volcanic asteroids, so I'm just gonna assume that it's a really good recreation. You do get to see Slash in the background of quite a few parts of the stage, so there's that. The level does take a nosedive, however, when we get to these things. They sink into the ground and leap out onto you, with the window of opportunity to hit them being minuscule if you dodge, and leaves you vulnerable if you try to hit them. It gets worse when they attack in packs, since you have even less room for error. Also, we are in an alternate dimension. Why are there still foot soldiers attacking me with mechanic tools? We deal with a few more stone warriors and foot soldiers on the way to the boss fight with Slash, who has a very upsetting amount of turtle skulls in his lair. He wields swords just like Leo and tries to spin after us, but he doesn't get very far and gets dizzy afterwards. He's much better at lobbing giant rocks and spinning in a shell, which doesn't make him dizzy. <laughs> wow, really expected more logical consistency from Teenage Mutant Ninja... I retract my statement. After Slash, we finally get entrance to Krang's hideout in Outworld Strange Awaits. This stage has a similar theme to the Baxter Stockman level, and as the final full level in the game, doesn't mess around. The second screen has you taking on multiple spider bots and some of the toughest foot soldier variants like the pink and blue ones. You take on stone soldiers, mega mousers, white and black foot soldiers all at once in rooms fit to burst with traps like spike floors. It's easily the most challenging level, but unlike the stockman level, doesn't completely overwhelm you with traps you can't fight back against. Plus, it's more fitting for this in the last level rather than level 12. The Triceratons even show back up, and you notice that they make a little pitter-patter noise when they run. Adorable. We get further in and don't do this to me, game. The level also is an endurance test with much bigger gaps between health items. You get rooms where they test exactly how many Mausers is too many Mausers, and a final power pizza wave before getting to Krang. We've spent the whole game trying to stop him from getting his body, and this fight certainly makes it feel climactic. Not only does Krang have his own boss theme, but the body itself has plenty of attacks, like splitting itself up, kicking, shooting out a flail. It's a thrilling fight, but we beat him all the same. However, the fight isn't over just yet. For my diversion, I have a surprise for you. <laughs> I will show you how a true ninja fights. <laughs> the world is mine. So there's a certain genre of music I can't get enough of, and that's hit jazz. You aren't ready for where this next sentence is going, but I promise it explains everything. Dragon Ball Fighters is a phenomenal game with a phenomenal soundtrack. Look out for Goku Black's theme, it's gonna be the sound of the summer. One of the characters in the game is Hit, tough, no-nonsense assassin character. Never jokes, is not silly, kills Goku, tough dude, right? What do you think Hit's theme song sounds like? That's right, the assassin gets a completely unfitting jazz track. Scientists are still trying to figure out an explanation, but somehow, the fact that it doesn't fit him in any way at all wraps back around to it fitting him perfectly. Uh, take the Knuckles rap for another great example of hit jazz. All of this is to say that the Shredder being played in by Ghostface Killa and Raekwon the chef of the Wu-Tang Clan makes no sense and makes perfect sense. We Ain't Came to Lose is my favorite track. It's so good and the lyrics are too perfect for this world. If you let it play long enough, you even get to hear the lyrics switch to the turtle's perspective. It's an amazing touch on an amazing boss. That's all without talking about the fight itself. They give you a pizza to heal up, but having to take on two bosses back to back is daunting and Shredder's solidifies his position as top dog. He can counter your hits, send you flying with lightning, avoid you with dive kicks, and worst of all, summon shadow clones. If you don't pay attention, you can lose track of the real one and get pummeled real quick. You'll eventually overcome him, but it is a thrill of a fight. However, you're not done yet. Shredder and Krang get away as we return to New York to see Krang took over the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> More like Statue of Tyranny, am I right? <laughs> Okay, game, I'll let you have this one. This is the most imposing boss so far. It takes up a good percentage of the screen. So I just wish it was a little tougher. Every one of the statue's attacks is a simple affair of either moving up, down, or jumping to dodge. None of the attacks really keep you from wailing on it. Even the fist slam is deceptively easy. It's still a super fun fight, and it's the best thing since JoJo's to include the national anthem as part of their boss theme. I just wish there was a little more challenge to it. After it's done, you're far from finished as Shredder takes mutagen and goes Super Shredder. 
The final boss is here and it's amazing! Not only is his theme a rock version of the previous theme, but his attacks are all super flashy and cool. At the price of being a bit easy to dodge, it's not a great sign when his ring of fire attack can be dodged by not moving. That's not to say he's easy, he's completely invulnerable except for when he uses his shield, weirdly enough, and his dash attack is super unpredictable, but when it's hands down the easiest stage to complete the no-hit challenge on, it's definitely noticeable. I can taunt mid-attack here, come on! Even if it isn't the toughest, it's still a great final boss, and I even managed to fail the challenge of not using the super attack in the last possible section, haha. <laughs> yes. I know I am quite the gaming specimen. After we shred the shredder, we get a news report saying that we have one group of green semi-aquatic warriors from a major metropolitan area to thank. It's the name you all know. It starts with a T. To punk frogs! I'm calling it right now. These guys were the devs. Oh, hey, Casey. Nice of you to finally show up. Let's just get a story mode ending real quick. All right, nice. Casey is an unlockable for beating the game. It is pretty worth it. He's my favorite. He has the best animations by far. So that's Shredder's Revenge. If me going through painstaking detail to explain each stage didn't tip you off, I love this game. It's one of the most charming, fun, and replayable games I've played in a long time and captures everything a great beat-em-up should be. I don't expect it too, but I'd love for this to be the start of a new era of people taking chances on this genre. It's the perfect multiplayer game for both hardcore fans of the genre and casual ones. And you can even market it to your friends who have an unhealthy lust for April O'Neil. Okay, do this again, but with the Power Rangers.